Hello and welcome to Product Popcorn, the podcast that explores topics related to product management, most of the time. We talk with product managers and also designers and engineers that work on product teams, and only sometimes discuss the possibility of artificial intelligence taking over the world. You can always read more at productpopcorn.com. This week on the podcast, we explore the product marketing and business intelligence side of product management with our guest, Sarah Smith. Writing the bridge between quant and qual, Sarah uses big data to mine customer insights and build marketing strategies for what she calls food, fashion, and fun brands like Cadoba, Forever 21, and Hello Kitty, just to name a few. Side note, Sarah has her master's in integrated marketing communications from Northwestern, which I think is pretty cool. In addition to talking about mining customer insights with big data, we discuss what Sarah calls a big data backlash. Like, how do we quantify the qualitative elements of the marketing strategy, like cultural relevance? We also dig deep on social listening and how this should be incorporated into your product marketing strategy. And we also, importantly, talk about pig iconography. Oh, you don't know about pig iconography? Well, you're going to have to listen to learn about it. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Product Popcorn. I'm Kimberly, and I'm a product manager. I'm Adam, and I am a professional masseuse for Mark Zuckerberg. That is, that's a good one. Right? Adam's a ba- uh, front-end developer. I'm a front-end developer. I almost said back-end, but that's not true. Sometimes, I know. Yeah. <laughs> we have Sarah with us today on the pod. Hi. Uh, so pumped. Um, Sarah is the best thing to come out of uh, my... Relationship with my ex-boyfriend, so we'll tell you Ooh. the story. <laughs> so juicy. <laughs> it's not really that juicy, no, but we'll make it sound yeah. juicy. No, you should have totally run with it. Make it real juicy. <laughs> it's so just not, though. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I wish it were more dramatic, but that's just not the kind of girls that uh, Sarah and I are. Do you, you want know? me to jazz up the story while you guys tell it? You... Make it juicy? Sure. We'll, we'll It's going to be that. mostly false. <laughs> mostly <laughs> Um, we're going to intro Sarah in just a second. We are um, we're going to talk about mining insights and big data backlash today um, with Sarah, who is a specialist in mining insights. Um, but first, really quick, we're just going to do a quick acronomicon. Acronomicon. <laughs> Yes, I love doing that. I was really struggling with acronomicons this week, and then I got two and one email. Um, the first one is IP. Which, of course, means uh, integral potatoes. <laughs> nope. Hmm. Intellectual property. Oh. So. Or internet provider. I was on. Oh. I was going with internet provider. Okay, yeah, that that's like more of a charter definition for sure, but... I guess either one of those. Okay. The other one um, is VOC. Which stands for very old crab cakes. (laughs) I was going to say voice of the customer. Yes. Sarah knows. Wow, that's beautiful. Sarah works in insights. (laughs) So, yeah, it's voice of the customer. So um, (laughs) if you do, like, I don't know, in product a lot, they say, like, a voice of the customer, voice of the consumer, like, research project and just talking to users and kind of putting together that comprehensive um, research. Anyway, so those are the two I had for today. Those are beautiful. Um, Now we move on to the best part where I ask Sarah ridiculous questions um, so we get to know her. Deeply, deeply personal questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go for it. Um, Sarah, did you know that you were the best thing to come out of uh, my past relationship? <laughs> no, I didn't. Um, I'm flattered. I would have assumed that, that just generally it was, you know, the impetus for you moving to Colorado and, you know, all, all of those beautiful life changes. But, mm. uh, but that's maybe a bit of a stretch. That is true. Well, I mean, you were definitely, like, the first person I hung out with when I got here. Oh, yeah. Which was great. That was fun. Um, So Adam asked how we met, Sarah and I met, and it was, let's paint a picture. It was a dark and rainy night, very cold, Chicago rainy night. This is getting good. (laughs) And it was in a jazz club. It was. Literally. You said this wasn't juicy. This is so juicy right now. So don't get confused. So my dad is actually a jazz musician in Chicago. Wow, cool. Yeah. And uh, one of my really good friends from high school was like, oh, I'm dating this girl, Kim. 
Um, and she's great, so I'm going to bring her. <laughs> And so that's how we met. So we went, yeah. And yeah. I think I think your brother was playing that night too, Probably, wasn't he? Probably, yeah. Yeah, it was oh. so. It was like one of the best Chicago nights. Actually, it was like Sarah's dad and her brother are like jamming on stage. Mm -hmm. um, it was really fun. I think I feel. I know your mom was there. Uh, yeah, I mean, and then like the rest of my Irish, Italian, Catholic family was probably there. <laughs> oh, nice. Oh yeah, yeah, like in the back. You do. Okay. It was really fun. Okay. Yeah. And then a year later, I broke up with that dude, but I was like, hey, I still know Sarah Smith, so it's all good. Yeah, this I is actually, totally worth it. <laughs> I saw him. Um, I saw him a couple weeks ago when I was in Chicago. Oh, real? Oh, you yeah, were in Chicago. I was in Chicago, and mm. I saw him, and that was great. Um, but very nice guy. But yeah, but here here we are now. Yeah. Yeah. And you're like, Kim is my friend now. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I didn't disclose. Okay. <laughs> There's no need to, you know, stir things up. Yeah. Okay, she that's just fair. doesn't mention me. Okay. Um, it's fine. Yeah, but anyway, okay. um, Sarah lives in Boulder, so I just have uh, some questions, food related questions. Mm, okay. What's your go to coffee shop? Oh, boxcar. Really? Yeah, okay. true story. Mm. Um, I'm also a really big fan of Trident. Ooh. Um, Trident has been around for quite a long time. So I actually moved to Boulder for the first time in 1999. Yeah, you um, went because you went to Boulder for I undergrad, did. Right? I went. I went to see you for undergrad, um, and and Trident has been a mainstay. Um, uh -huh. has a, um, Delicious gum. <laughs> I think it's a different <laughs> Trident. Oh. Uh, yeah. So, That's a good one. Um, but yeah, that was. I, um, and I, I prefer the glee gum. Um, glee. Yeah, the glee, or the simple gum, you know, the, the, the ones that don't have the chemicals because I live in Boulder. Oh, yeah, I don't know these <laughs> Boulder things. I'm one of them dirty Denverites. Okay. Yeah, we both they are. Say. But that's okay. I mean, I'm half and half since I commute, but I'm an Ozo girl. Myself, mm, okay. I do love the Ozo. That stuff is like jet fuel. It is. Ozo? It's, it's a little, it's a coffee shop. We're oh. still talking coffee, Boulder coffee shops. Okay. Yeah. Very important. Um, do you, um, you know the current trend of the bougie popsicle? I do. What, I'm wait. a fan. Are you a fan? I'm not a fan. No? Okay. What? No, are but. You, are you going to describe what this is? It's a bougie popsicle, so what? it's just like a. Bougie? You're saying with the zzz. Yeah, like a bourgeois, like a yeah. bougie popsicle. <laughs> High-end, over-the-top. High popsicle. Oh, I see. Very precious. Because I was, uh, I thought you maybe just had like a slight speech impediment and was trying to say <laughs> boozy popsicle. But that would be better. Yeah, I could get into bougie. that. We could get into that. Yeah. Uh, I Food had truck. A, I had a blueberry cardamom popsicle last week mm. and dipped in dark chocolate and it did hit the spot. <sighs> mm, mm, this is tempting. so bolder right now. Yeah. Ugh. It's very bolder. Okay, one last question that has nothing to do with bolder. Okay. Um, and I've asked several guests this. I'm keeping a tally. Pandas or red pandas? So I actually, I heard somebody else say red pandas, and it <laughs> sounded like that was the right answer, <laughs> but I am just pandas. And oh. Yeah, I know. I like your bravery. Yeah. I like, I like yeah. that you're willing to say pandas. I am. It's, it's, pan I love black and white. Um, oh. I love black, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can so. just paint them. Paint the cuter one black and white. <laughs> or just paint the cuter one red, right? And then I win. Oh, it's true. Like um, giant no. red panda. No. I think oh. I, I'm like a, a little, you know, a petite, petite panda. Petite panda. All right. Fair enough. Well, um, we are going, we're talking about big data backlash today. Um, so... Sarah, I'm going to have you explain kind of your background and what you do, but um, I heard you talk at, um, what do they call it in Boulder? Ignite. Ignite Boulder about five years ago, That's, and I remembered yeah, this because wow. I was at Ignite a couple weeks ago, and I was like, nobody will ever top Sarah's big data Ignite oh, speech. It was wow. so good. Damn. And it was five years ago, and I remember thinking, like, this girl's a total badass. So anyway, I'll let you kind of talk a little bit about mining insights and business intelligence and kind of what you do. She got a tattoo of your face after that. It was so <laughs> Oh, good. dear. There's probably it's a too lot. Far. Of, yeah. <laughs> oh, too okay. soon. Sorry. A lot we'll, of features we'll talk that about would that need to be time. navigated, so okay. no. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. I um, So I grew up, and I'm using the air quotes there, in the industry um, on the PR side. And uh, I came up through um, through a program at Northwestern, and then after that transitioned into more traditional advertising. 
Um, and then up until a couple of years ago, I had a, a variety of roles on the agency side um, before jumping that proverbial fence, so to speak, and heading um, to the client side where I was actually at the helm of the marketing department at Qdoba, um, which was a lot of fun, um, incredible, powerful learning experience. And then since the beginning of this year, I have been a free agent. You're freelancing now. I am, and it's amazing. Um, and I'm, I'm really proud of a lot of the work that I've been able to do with my clients um, who, who run the gamut from food, fashion, fun, and fuel. So you're mainly marketing-based then. Your job yeah, revolves around marketing. Yeah, would you say you're in marketing? marketing, or would you say, like... Yeah, so most of the work that I do at the end of the day is actually um, marketing at its core. Mm-hmm. So um, then specifically... The, um, the output is really account planning or strategic process, strategic development, um, mining insights, and then really um, bringing that voice of the consumer, voice mm-hmm. of the customer. VSA. Yeah. I um, love that. Uh, to life, to, to take those, um, those insights and to really build a consumer-centric program. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So that's ultimately what it's about. But um, but when you say marketing, so like you, you are a quant, right? Like, I'm not. No. Okay. No. But but it's a fair thing. So I actually kind of ride um, ride that line and build the bridge between quant and qual. Um, okay. And that's one of the things about um, the methodology of social listening, which really relies on big data um, for f- you know for all the different inputs and and what the core of it ultimately amounts to, um, is it, it kind of blends quant and qual, which, yeah. you know, for, for more traditional um, researchers, they, they tend to get goosebumps or freak out or feel a little sick to their stomach when I say things like that. <laughs> um, but, but what it is, is we're able to, to quantify um, some of the more unique qualitative, um, qualitative outputs in an unbiased and unprompted way. So maybe a little heady, but, you know, think about it in terms of, like, every tweet that's out there, or like, mm-hmm. every blog post, mm-hmm. or, you know, any piece of content, or any like, comment, whatever, right? Right. Um, you know, what, maybe it's these potatoes you were mentioning, so has an opinion. <laughs> They're integral. Way, yeah, one way or another. <laughs> um, and so what we're able to do is build these queries. Mm. And so... Called topics? Sometimes called topics. Yeah, it totally depends on the software. Um, the voc- I mean, I wouldn't know that because I work on a big data social listening product. I don't. They listen to everything. Yeah, <laughs> they listen to everything, yes. um, which is awesome. So especially for... And scary. Yeah, for... I don't know why people think it's scary. I don't think it's scary. Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you think? Mm-hmm. Do you really think it's scary? Mm-hmm. I mean, like... Nope. Definitely don't. <laughs> okay. Zero. You know, I just everything I put on Facebook or Twitter, like I'm totally fine if brands look at that. You know, know, yeah, that's true. Uh, there's the. You it's know, not private information. I have thousands of people, you know, looking at it. So if if it was truly private, you wouldn't actually post it out for the world to see. It's just, I think the the thing for me is that understanding the scope of what how visible it truly is because. I think a lot of time you post on Facebook, you like and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. You you're like, okay, well, this is just me and my friends, but it's not, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, well, all sorts a lot of marketers of, yeah, are looking at that. That's the mm-hmm. thing, and and there's um, there's quite a bit of a brouhaha, so to speak, depending on how your privacy settings are set. Yeah. And um, one of my favorite tools is actually um, it's a tool out of Boston called Crimson Hexagon. Okay. <gasps> Um, I know. I know. I know so much about Crimson. I know. I figured you probably had a lot to say about Crimson, but it's one of my favorites, and I'll tell you why. It's a great product. Um, it is because um, of the way that you build these queries. Yeah. And so um, you basically you build your query based on Boolean logic. Mm-hmm. So it's a series of you know ands, ors, and nots. Right. right. So it could be. Um, I want to look at Chipotle and Kidoba, or right. I want to look at Chipotle or Kidoba. Right. right. Or I want to look at Queso, mm-hmm. and I want to see, you know, Moe's Chipotle, Kidoba, and Baja Fresh Queso. Yeah. Right. Why not? It's a big query. Um, mm. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
But but the way that Crimson works um, the, with their algorithm, it's a little bit different because it's machine-based learning. And so as a user, you have the ability to go in and make the product work for you yeah. as opposed to some of the other solutions um, which are based on the NLP algorithm. <laughs> and that's natural language processing um, where oftentimes you're prone to false positives. And the example that I love to use on that one is the bomb. The bomb. The bomb. Like that queso is the bomb. Especially if you're doing sentiment analysis, mm -hmm. something like the bomb could be misconstrued as like a negative sentiment yeah. when really the bomb, we come and at my job, we, it, we approach us a lot um, mm -hmm. with companies like, let's say it's Orkin, you know, is mm -hmm. looking for words like kill, um, you know, destroy, like that's wow. a positive right. sentiment in the case of Oregon because power, it's happening. Well, you're yeah. trying to kill bugs or you're trying to kill rats in your house, right? Mm -hmm. So that's like, that's positive in that case. Um, but, you know, like she's saying, um, with the destroy, people say destroy with Oregon. I don't, I'm just thinking of. Okay. Well, because that is intense. Well, you know what, you bring up a really good point and this is something that I, um, it's a little bit of a tangent, but it's really important to okay. me. Okay. Um, is the difference between how people talk and boardroom attributes. So, yeah. like, you know, for example, in food service, um, one of the things we talk about is day part. And so What's it's that? Like, um, it's breakfast or lunch or dinner. Oh. You know, so I, I will have, um, sometimes my boss would say things to me like, you know, I really want some intelligence around what's going on during the afternoon day part. And I'm like, the afternoon, the day, afternoon part. day part. I've never heard yeah. that phrase. I haven't either. Yeah, oh, it's a hot one. Um, <laughs> it's a hot one. Know. It's the bomb. Yeah, it's the bomb, yeah. So, I know. Also, I feel like we just totally dated ourselves. Like, we were up at the 90s with the bomb. Um, but I'm fine with it. So, sorry, when you go to build a query, you wouldn't actually type in afternoon day part. Uh huh. It would be like afternoon snack or lunch. Um, or early dinner or things like that because okay. you know that's you want to use the language um, that your guests are that your consumers are um, rather than trying to couch it into what I like to call those boardroom attributes. Okay, interesting. interesting. To think about. Yeah. So so let's use like an example. So let's say okay, so you're freelancing now. Mm -hmm. um, we'll say I'm Chipotle because we don't want to be Kidoba because you actually worked there. <laughs> okay. um, and like, what would I if if I were coming to you as a new client? What mm -hmm. would I be asking for? Oh, man. So could it be anything or like? Cheese analytics. <laughs> so let's say I'm, I'm working, you know, with a fast casual or QSR in the space, right? And we can use the example of Chipotle. Um, oftentimes they don't really know what it is that they want. Um, mm -hmm. At the end of the day, they want burritos and mouths. Sure. They want people talking about the brand. They want um, to build awareness. They want so to they're coming traffic. to you with their problem is that like they want to build brand awareness. Yeah. Is that, okay. Um, or a lot of times it's like foot traffic is down, sales are down, mm -hmm. um, or impressions are down, mm -hmm. um, or maybe not necessarily down, but there's room to room to grow, room to yep. go up. Um, so I try to take a look at, at what it is, you know, depending on the category or the vertical or the industry, um, that's really going to make a difference at the heart of their business. Sure. Okay. Um, so, so, so where, where do you start with that? So Chipotle, um, trying to build more brand awareness, trying to get impressions up, like where do you start with your analysis? Yeah. So usually, um, where I'll start is ask, you know, do you have existing research, is there anything that's front and center? Are there any um, larger goals or objectives that need to be achieved? I really try to go with, um, you know, what the board is is holding their departments accountable to. Um, I know it might sound really basic, but at the end of the day, when no, you think about like yeah. how how we report up the ladder, yeah. um, if I'm not delivering work that's relevant to what their board cares about, like I might as well just go home now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we start there, and so then let's say for example. Um, traffic is down, okay? And so one of the things that, that I would like to, to see is, you know, the own, their own data, right? So do they have real estate data or what did they have um, that is going to help us tell that story? Sure. Um, or is it that um, you know, there have been an overall decrease in seems for sales or, you mm -hmm. know, we've shuttered locations. It, the list could go on, right? Did we actually spend less on media this year than we did last year? It right seems now? the scope of that could be so huge it because, can. like, depending on what market you're in, 
you could have like cultural and world, you know, events that could mm-hmm. affect your traffic and totally. knowing when to. Right. Yeah. Okay. But Adam, you bring up a really great point because I think at the end of the day, um, one of the most critical pieces of the equation is: Are you culturally relevant? Mm-hmm. As a brand and with your messaging and what you and your product offering and what you deliver to um, to your customers to your consumers. Okay. Because if you aren't, you know, and if you're not staying current in the middle of all of these events or you know whatever's happening, yeah. you're gonna fall out of favor pretty quickly. Yeah. So, so yeah, something to think about. So anyway, so let's say. I almost got real political there. Oh, almost. <laughs> oh, God. Let's, let's not. It's too Reeled that one in before <laughs> it came out. <laughs> A really good way to crash your social listening tool, like data collection, just enter a query or a topic with a keyword Trump and let it run oh, for wow, yeah. approximately three minutes. <laughs> Is that all? I would imagine it would take all night. Uh, well, there have been days where mm-hmm. it has taken not so long, mm. but <laughs> perhaps mm. in last November. <laughs> Yikes. But anyway. Yeah, okay. Um, sorry, go ahead, Sarah. No, don't don't apologize at all. So, um, So we'll go through this process, you know, kind of mine through or, or sift through the data that, that's existing on the client side. And then um, I will generally apply just some quick and dirty social listening to it. So um, like getting a sense of, you know, things like you were talking about sentiment, mm-hmm. um, where people are talking about the brand, what are some key words, are there, are there menu items that tend to, um, to trend or that people really like? And so then how we turn that into a marketing program is let's say people are loving pork. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so the other maybe, white meat. Yeah, the other white meat sometimes. Um, <laughs> Unless yeah. it's bacon. Mm. <laughs> oh, bacon. Uh, okay, so let's say they love pork. So, you know, there are certain things that we can tap into um, to make more to make pork a more prevalent part of the equation. So, you know, we can look at um, like pig iconography or we can do <laughs> what? Nothing. This I is a love, real I mean, this I is love yeah. this, I real, just love the yeah. phrase pig iconography. Yeah, oh, you do. <laughs> Pig, where like they kind of you know talk about like the the belly and like all the different yeah. you know right. yeah. um, or what we can do is is get really laser focused and really hyper targeted with these things. Mm-hmm. Um, take our existing guest data, see what they're ordering, market to them um, items that they've ordered in the past. Maybe give them a traffic driving incentive, like a coupon or like a bogo. You know, bring your friend. Um, something like that. So, so okay. that's that's a little bit of how it works. But, but as far as the um, the process of of mining those insights, um, it's really, I think, to sum it up, about asking asking those right questions, yeah. really getting to the core um, of what the problem is, and and that might take days or weeks. But I think having the patience, um, having the wherewithal, and being able to to put the rigor behind it is what's going to make the difference. Um, and then as far as, as going through that process of mining the insights themselves, um, it's a, it's a really funny thing. Cause like you have those moments, you're like, how do I know that this is the right insight? It's true. You know? Yeah. Especially with social listening. Cause yeah. it's anyway. Or like but, what makes an insight? Yeah. You know, because you could, you could find something like, um, okay, let's say, um, baked beans are trending. Okay. Right? Is that a fact or an insight? Right? Well, I don't actually know if they are or not. So don't. No, don't no, I know, but I, I've come um, across stuff like that and just mm-hmm. running queries at work. Like, oh, or, you know, if maybe I have a baked beans query or topic running and then I see, like, uh, in themes and terms, um, which would be like, Underline, you know, themes that yeah. go along with baked beans could be like asparagus, and I'm mm-hmm. like, are people eating baked beans with asparagus? Like, who knew? Right. So sometimes those insights, I feel like they come along, you don't even, you don't know yeah, what you're looking for until totally. you see it. And you know, and, and so much of it can depend too, like on the date range. Like, let's say that you know, maybe there's some seasonality to things like asparagus and baked beans. So they're not necessarily eating them together, but there's been a spike in sales or if yeah. there was inclement weather that maybe impacted something on the asparagus um, farming. I mean, there's just a whole host of things. And yeah. so you really have to, to dig in. You almost don't know what you're looking for until you start digging right. in and you start like getting yeah. some yeah. feedback. Are we going to talk about how you take that immense amount of data and then funnel it into some useful 
information. Yeah, well, that was totally where I was going with this. Well, I think, well, what Sarah and I were talking about more than that is, like, I mean, for for marketing, product marketing and product management just in general, you know, you're you're usually defining, like, those KPIs and you're looking, you're looking to get those by, you know, mining insights or just using large amounts of data um, and, you know, slicing and dicing it in many different ways. But something that Sarah had mentioned was that there's recently been, like, a big data backlash Mm -hmm. almost. And I think the way that you phrased it is, um, hold on, let me look. One of the things um, that I find most interesting is that clients are looking to bring back the emotion Mm -hmm. into their work. It's almost like big data backlash a kind of back to basics. So my question is, like, um, how how do you define success if it's not with numbers? Yeah. Poof. That's a good one. It's a million dollar question. Yeah, so. it is. Well, no, it's so so it's really funny. Okay, and and I'll I'll go back to this example about being hyper targeted and laser focused. Right. right. Okay. So let's say you're going back to our problem of traffic is down, and so what we're tasked to do is drive traffic. Mm-hmm. And one of the tactics that we can um, pull the lever on is just going really um, direct. So, you know, emailing mm-hmm. or um, creating like a mobile geofence around certain locations to geofence. bump people. Yeah, geofence. <laughs> oh, I know, you like that. I like that. Um, yeah, to get people in store, you know, sending them. Um, Messaging or marketing around maybe an item they've already purchased and yeah. so on. Okay, so where's the emotion in that? Yeah, right. Like there, maybe there's there's the implication that there's um, a one to one connection or that it's predictive and personalized. Mm-hmm. But when you look at that through the lens of awareness or that larger emotional pull, mm-hmm. and so you know when you're you're being um, inspired by your heartstrings, yeah. You know, or or you're the kind of brand that people are talking about because they're doing such great things, or because mm-hmm. you're making a difference, or because you're culturally relevant, right? Um, and I I think that's a big part of at the end of the day what success looks like, even though you're not quantifying it. Okay, so one one way we can look at success is like, okay, yes, we we drove traffic. Traffic is up. Profits are up. Right. That profits are up. Share price is up. You know? Yeah. And, and that's, a, I think, a big part of it, too, is, um, you know, sometimes success is measured through the lens of long, long-term long shareholder value or shareholder growth. Um, but but when you think about it at a much larger level, what's behind that? Mm-hmm. And oftentimes it, it really is um, that that inspiration and that that your brand is being talked about in a positive light, that it's, mm-hmm. it's making a difference. Um, do you have an example of like recent client work or that you can talk about or maybe keep the client name anonymous oh, if needed? Yeah, there's so many brands out there. I think that people are talking about one of them. It's not they're not a client of mine. Um, but if you're listening away, I am totally available. <laughs> uh, and I, I love to travel. You know, we um, have lots of friends of the pod. Warren Buffett, for example, oh, friend yeah. of the pod. Yeah. Oh, friend of the pod. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Love you, Warren. Um, Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so are you guys familiar with away luggage? I have seen it advertised on Facebook. Mm-hmm. It's very effective. Yeah. So, and I think one of the things that that they do really well uh, from a messaging and communication standpoint is they they blend um, the real with the aspirational. Yeah. And so, you know, they you you see the luggage, you see the the utility component to it, you see what they're offering, you see that they're offering um, a real solution, but there's also um, something kind of dreamy about it, like I can go anywhere. Yeah. Um, which I think is so brilliant. I wonder if I'm just not in their target audience because I never talk about travel. And so I honestly didn't Oh, know. they hit me hard. Mm-hmm. And it's so well, effective. You are, well, you're you're right in there because you do a lot of traveling. That's true. They probably know that yeah. I travel a lot. But I love their mm-hmm. ads. It's just they're short. They like, you know, it and... It's it's very much like kind of a Warby Parker model. Mm-hmm. Like, let's take something that is historically very expensive for absolutely no reason, mm-hmm. an eight hundred percent markup, and and it and it just. But the experience that they kind of sell you in those short video ads mm-hmm. is is alluring. Oh yeah, <laughs> I think one of the other brands that's really doing um, doing it well, and this is an interesting one, um, is McDonald's. So yeah, they stepped up their marketing. I know, I'm loving it. 
Oh, of you know you were waiting for it. <laughs> <laughs> You're totally waiting for it. Um, there's there's a campaign that they have out right now um, about the the chicken tenders or whatever that yeah. they're good enough for grandma. You know, and so grandma's busy doing all these other things. She's living her life in a culturally um, current way. She's wow, this swiping is so on deep. Tin- yeah, she's grandma's so on hip. Tinder. Tinder, wow. Yeah, or, or some <laughs> other you know swipeable dating app. Um, and she's living life, but at the end of the day, the chicken tenders are still, they're good enough for her. Uh-huh. Um, it's yeah. its fun, um, and it's an emotional, you know, story with the, the family and, and bringing yeah. everyone together, um, but but still being out there and living their life. And so I think um, I think they're, they're one that I would tip my hat to as well. But to get back to what you were talking about, about, about those KPIs, and, and one last point that I, I want to make that I think is really important, um, you know, as, as part of um, you know, where big data falls in the equation. I think so much of the work that we do, um, at the end of the day, we ask ourselves, is this measurable? And so mm-hmm. we, we get caught up, we get distracted um, by the wrong metrics. And so we're looking at things maybe like impressions or, um, or reach, mm-hmm. or we look at number of mentions. Um, and that, while that tells part of the story, it's not, it's not the full picture. And I think that one of the things that we need to make sure that we're looking at at the end of the day is, is our problem being solved? If it's a traffic problem, but our mentions are up, it's like, okay, great. You know? And so then that's the, that, that moment of contrived success. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so it's not true success, but, it, but it's a small win. Okay. Um, the thing that's also interesting with that is that, that some of those metrics can, can be, you know, proxy or stand in. You know, and so if we see that there's a trend in mentions, can we draft off of that to drive traffic? Can we take control, own that conversation that comes from, you know, years of working in PR is really like, yeah. you know, commandeer that message um, to make it work for you. But but I think that, that that's the, the one of the things that I want to say, you know, above all here is, is just make sure that you're looking um, at the right things because a lot of, of agencies that I've worked with are at – um, you know, we're like, oh, well, look at all this media success that we're seeing. You know, you have like those standard KPIs that you always come back right. to that everybody measures. Yeah. So, okay, so let's let's do a quick real life example. So, Av okay. and I used to work on a TV app, so the Spectrum TV app. Mm-hmm. So, um, if we were if we were in this is a TV app that like you turn on your television with your cable box okay. and you're like navigating and it it was like the new. Um, UI, the updated UX, like new and shiny, beautiful. Um, As like a product manager for that product, I was measuring a lot of like the standard KPIs, like, um, you know, what are, what are people searching for? What Mm -hmm. are the top shows? How long are people spending um, at a time on, you know, on using the product? Um, Just all those standard obvious measurable outcomes. Mm-hmm. Um, if you were working on that project, what what else would you measure? Or like where would you start? How would, what would be your methodology for oh, measuring it, success? Well, I think a lot of it would be like, okay, so what what is success here, right? Mm-hmm. And so in in the example of this product that you're talking about, it sounds like success is number of active users. Yeah. Right? And you know subscriptions or yeah, yeah active yeah. users. Okay, so so number of subscriptions. So I would I would try to take a look at um, the people who subscribe, and who who are they? Mm-hmm. Um, how can we effectively communicate to what I would call a lookalike audience, um, and say how can we get our product in front of these people who've demonstrated that they use and love it? And so I would also look at time spent on site or time spent with product. Um, because if you can see the people who are really like, you know, into it, they, it, it it's life changing for them perhaps. I don't know. Maybe that's a bit of a stretch, but, yeah. but maybe for some people it is. Um, so I would take all of those things, all of those metrics, um, like, you know, active users, who they are, try to get, um, build a consumer profile, maybe even build a persona. Yeah. Um, and then create a lookalike audience and then market to that lookalike audience because ultimately at the end of the day, we want to increase our number of active users or active subscribers. Because this was something that I actually um, had many conversations with among the product team was, is time on the app actually a relevant KPI hmm, because this is this is my thing and, and maybe perhaps I consume television differently than mm-hmm. the wider obvi- audience um, but mm-hmm. 
you know, I pay for a cable subscription. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's for me, it's not the amount of time I spend mm. watching television. Mm-hmm. It's that I can get exactly what I want when I want it. Mm. And actually, for me, it's a reduced amount of time is success for me because okay. I don't want to have to be searching. I don't mm-hmm. want to have to be, you know, watching something that I don't want to watch. Mm-hmm. I want to be, I have like very specific needs and I want it to be like efficient almost, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. So yeah. that time is not a qualifier for success because you could be confused or there may be some, some, some other or challenges. Yeah. 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 So. Interesting. I didn't think of that. Um, but it's really smart, smart point because I, And the way that I look at it, right, is, you know, what's a proxy for engagement? Yeah. Okay. And so, but it might not necessarily be a positive engagement. Yeah. During that time, there could be, like you said, a lot of frustration or a lot of, like, I can't find my show or... Um, and how do you measure that? Like yeah. it's, you know, a lot of that is just very, you, you're kind of as, making some assumptions mm-hmm. from the data too. And yeah. You run that against how angry their Facebook posts are at a certain <laughs> point in the day. Well, you could. I mean, you literally <laughs> could do that. Yeah, yeah. You, you actually If could. you can match up social handles or authors somehow mm-hmm. um, with that, you could literally yeah. do that. And yeah. that's happening now too, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so it's it's pretty powerful, but that that is a really good point. Um, and I always like it always amazing because you know we had a huge um, analytics team yeah. at Charter, oh, and yeah. um, you know it was it was always you know here's the numbers and this is what it means. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot sometimes you know they'd be giving these presentations to big execs or yeah. like you know C level, and I'm and I I sometimes I feel that it wasn't. It was just taken as fact, like mm. this is what the number means. When there's actually a lot of possibility, yeah. yeah, there's kind of some subjectivity into it's not a black and white thing. Yeah, it's not yeah. black and white. Like like we were just saying, you know, time on site or time on app, time spent on it. Like, what does that really mean? Yeah, Do, is that a good thing if it's longer? Is there a frustration? And that mm-hmm. I don't. I mean, that's a one example. Yeah, but. the way I would look at that too, though, is. Um, so if, if we're looking to see if someone's having a bad experience, right? So is there a correlation between time on site or time on app um, and then attrition? Yeah. Right? So are we losing these users? So the users who spend more time, are they actually canceling their subscription? Yeah. You know, and what's the story there? Um, or are the users who are spending less, are they more longer, uh, l- less time? Are they longer term users? And, you know, what's the value of, of those accounts and yeah. you know, things like that? So, um, but, but yeah, I mean, it is, a, it's a really challenging thing. Um, and I also think that's a, a part of where qualitative research yeah. can come in and support the process. Um, because it's not really just about social listening as a methodology or, or quant or surveys as a methodology mm-hmm. or, you know, qualitative, like, in-homes or focus groups. It's about how all these different things work together sure. to tell the whole story. Mm-hmm. So what do you think is going to be possible in 5 or 10 or 20 years oh, um, in this field that isn't possible now? Mind reading. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Are you are you microchipped, Adam? Uh, <laughs> not yet. Not that I know of. I mean, my dog is. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Every time um, I go to the vet, they scan something behind my ears. <laughs> so do. maybe I am. When was the last time you were at the vet? <laughs> I am. Um, yesterday. Yeah, I, t- right. I took him yes, yesterday. Right, yes. <laughs> Get my shots. Yeah. Good. Uh, no, you know one of the things that is is most interesting to me right now. Um, is just the proliferation of connected homes, yeah, um, and and the idea that you know because at first it was your your desktop and then it was your laptop and then it was your mobile, mm-hmm. um, and now it's this thing that's sitting on your counter that can hear every fucking pardon my language, yeah, th- you know everything that comes out of your mouth and that data. Um, you know, through voice recognition software, which is fully automated, you know, is and it's so good now. Mm-hmm. It's fantastic, but I, I do think that that's um, it's going to be one of the the biggest things to to watch out for um, within the next five years is is the power of the connected home. Yeah, um, and, and just that so we're going to have like comprehensive social profiles of these mm-hmm. different personas. Yeah, there's just going to be personas. I feel like is going to become such a difficult thing to even put together for a product in five years. Well, I think they're going to so be. Too. There's going to have so many different mm-hmm. like how niche personas. How warm was it when they had the, in their house when they had their intense craving for Qdoba? <laughs> 
literally that, that data you get, from but Ness. But they'll know. Yeah. You can get that specific, though. Yeah, you can. Well, and that's the thing. So I don't even know that personas will continue to carry the relevance yeah. that they do now because we can get so hyper-targeted. Yeah. So it's much more about one-to-one than it is about, you know, creating some sort of hypothetical situation. Yeah. Because you're out of the realm of the hypothetical. You're you're de facto connected. And there are all kinds of opportunities to exploit, you know, each individual touch point throughout the course of the day. Do you think that there's ever going to be too much information? Well, so I actually think we're already there. You know, when, yeah. when we were talking about this with, with mm-hmm. these folks, um, you know, going through streams of data and one of the biggest challenges that, that I go through is, you know, how is this actionable? Is it really actionable or mm-hmm. is it opinion? Um, and, and so much of, of that challenge is that there's so much data and most of it doesn't mean jack. Yeah. Like, if you think about how many people are like, yo, I got to get me some queso. <laughs> like, <laughs> just like me. on Twitter. Yeah, all day, every day. And you're like, okay, so people love queso, but what's what's really the story there? You know, is yeah. it like they've had a tough day or they're looking for those moments of indulgence or, you know, they want to celebrate comfort food or what is the story they're trying to tell about themselves through these tweets? Yeah. Let's not get into people who tweet. <laughs> no, no politics, right? Nope. Nope. Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, you can if you want. I, no, I don't no, care. No, I'll, I'll leave it to you, Adam. Okay. <laughs> um, but but yeah. So what are what are we telling about ourselves and and why and what's the real story? Yeah. Because and then you you cross that with like you know tens of thousands of what I like to call queso tweets. And you're like, why? What? What is this? Um, and sometimes it's it's like nothing. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing. It really is. Nothing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, what are we going to do with all of this data? Where is it going to live? What is it going to do to stretch our system? Yeah. How much of a distraction rather than a solution is it actually going yeah. to become? That's an excellent way to put it because I think about that a lot. Like how much of this data is actually worth looking at it and like how do you know which are the right things to look mm-hmm. at? But um, it goes back to the questions you're at, you know, yeah. what is it that you're trying to solve for? Yeah. It, in, it, it'll be interesting to see the choices that companies make as far as what do we keep and what do we throw out and mm-hmm. you know at the end of the day um, a, a lot of when we talk about success and we talk about success you know particularly with working with big data is so much of it comes from you know the ability of of clients internal teams yeah um, and what they're able to share and how they're able to um, to kind of streamline what that process looks like. Yeah. As part of this this big data backlash, um, there was a term we were playing with a few years ago called little data, actually. I like that. Um, it's cute. Yeah. It was like, how do we we make big data <laughs> actionable, you know, as we actually parse it out um, and work with, with smaller, more manageable um, data Bits. sets yeah, yeah. That, that are relevant to, to the task at hand. At, at the end of the day, like, once you've achieved – statistical significance you're there yeah and so anything on top of that is is gravy or it's a cherry yeah but, but then past a certain threshold it's a distraction yeah yep. i think so mm-hmm. all right um we'll wrap it up so any any final words sarah oh man i have many um <laughs> I could keep going forever. She just pulled um, out a huge scroll. <laughs> just, hear ye, hear ye. Oh, that's really funny. No, I, I think um, just just overall, you know, when when you're working with data, um, when you're mining insights, and when you're going through that process, is you know, like I've talked about, is really think about you know what is what's now, um, what's next. Uh, where have you come from, um, and where do you want to go? Nice. That's good. I like that. Adam, do you have any last words? They were they were her her words. Oh, oh. that's oh, you were gonna say the same thing as Sarah. Yeah, he like totally pretty much was. exactly. Yeah. yeah, she took it right out. Hear you, hear you. Guys are so on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, Sarah, where can we find you? Oh, you can find me all over the place. Um, I am on Instagram. I'm Sarah E. Smith, and it's S-A-R-A, so Sarah E. Smith. And I'm on Twitter at the Sarah E. 
Ooh. Yeah. And we'll put it in the show notes, too, cool. so you can find Sarah. Um, follow her on Twitter and Insta. Yeah, please do. Did you know what I learned today at work? Sorry, this is a very quick no, fun fact. No, tell me. Uh, you definitely know this, but I'm maybe some of our listeners don't, that Instagram has um, twice the number of daily active users as Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, that's crazy. It's, wow. Yeah. Twice. Uh-huh. I knew that it was significantly more than Twitter and that Twitter's user base has been drastically falling like month over month, mm-hmm. but I didn't know it had reached like That's crazy. Double. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. So. Thanks for having me. Yay. Yeah. We're, please come back when we review Black Mirror. Do you want to review Black Mirror? Oh, In. yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. We're waiting for it, guys. I keep checking. They have not, Netflix has not set a release date yet. Soon. I know. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrow. Oh, maybe not that soon. Maybe not that soon. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks for listening to Product Popcorn. You can subscribe to the podcast or leave a review on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. You can always read more at productpopcorn.com or follow us on Twitter at Product Popcorn. <laughs>